All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I'm in this 2017 Jaguar F-Pace. This is a car that's done wonders for Jaguar. It's helped them, or at least it's, it's helping them, shed their caddish old man image. With every car like this they release, the image of John Prescott is getting more and more distant. The F-Pace is Jaguar's first attempt at making an SUV. Can you believe them? It took until 2016 to try and tap into that very lucrative market. But from a buyer's point of view, I think it was worth the wait. I've driven around in this all morning, and one thing I've noticed is you see lots of them on the road. They're a very popular car, and I think that's for one of many reasons. Firstly, you've got the styling. Now, I think it looks great. They've stayed true to the brand. It's very menacing and mean looking. The front end actually looks like a, like a roaring Jaguar. The line between aggressive and, you know, just downright ugly is a very thin one, but I think Jaguar have trodden it very carefully. Looks good, this. It's no surprise to discover that the F-Pace was designed by the talented Mr. Callum, you know, from XK and DB9 fame. Sorry if you can hear a rattle coming from the back, it's got a dog guard this, which is doing my head in. From the driver's seat, you look out over the bulging, muscular bonnet. It's very purposeful. There isn't a single bad angle. It's very well balanced. Of course, this is the R Sport model, so it does look a little bit sportier. You could have also gone with the base spec Prestige, or the more luxurious portfolio. Now, personally, I would go for luxury over sports. I'd probably go with the portfolio, but you can't argue with the way the R-Sport looks. The wheel design is very good. They fit in the arches nicely. If you're something of an environmentalist, then you'll dismiss this car as another silly, unnecessarily large, thirsty SUV. But you'd be wrong, because it's neither of those things. It's actually very good on fuel. And size-wise, I think the F-Pace is the perfect size SUV for European roads. It's not so small that you lose any of its practicality, but it's also not too big and wide that you'll struggle to park it in a supermarket car park, you know, like a full-size Range Rover. It's more spacious and practical this than an Audi Q5 or a Porsche Macan. Inside, it's stylish and contemporary. It isn't stuffy or fuddy-duddy like Jags of old. There's not a single ounce of wood. It's all very similar to the sporty Jag XE, actually. You can also go with a two-tone upholstery like this one, or if you want something a bit more racy, you can go with red and black. This is about as far removed from an old XJ Sovereign as is possible. This is definitely a 21st century Jaguar. I know this is a bit of a cliche when talking about car interiors, but it's genuinely a nice place to be. It's light and bright and airy. The panoramic glass roof's a nice touch too. Of course, because this is an SUV, the driving position is near perfect. It's very commanding. It's elevated, but it's not too lofty. It's just about right. All of the buttons and switches are laid out very clearly. Everything's easy to find. I mean, it's full of tech, this car, but it doesn't feel too cluttered. It's not a complete button fest like some cars are. It all feels fairly well built, too. I mean, when you bear in mind this car's four years old with 50,000 miles on the clock, there's not a single bit of wear or tear. I honestly could be sat in a new car. One of my favourite things is this steering wheel. It's lovely. It's thick and padded. It just feels expensive to touch. The steering in general is very good. It's well weighted, so it's not too heavy, but it's also not too light and it's actually pin sharp. With the cruise control set to the speed limit, there's not much wind or road noise. It's all nice and refined, really. You can barely hear the diesel engine, which is good because those two liter Ingenium engines don't sound the best. On the steering wheel, you've got controls for the stereo as well as the cruise control. The rest of the interior from waist high up is finished very well. You've got nicely stitched leather here. You've got a good choice of materials. Everything feels, feels quite nice. From the waist down, it's not quite so good. You've got cheap feeling, scratchy plastics. But I suspect they've done that on purpose. A bit like the Discovery 5 I filmed with recently. It just makes it easier to keep clean. But it does kind of detract from what could otherwise be a very upmarket interior. There are a couple of annoying creaks and rattles I've noticed, which are fairly common on Jaguar Land Rover products. One annoying one I've noticed from this door card. It kind of feels hollow. And when you put it under a little bit of load, you can hear it rattling slightly. It's fairly easy to drown out with a stereo, but it shouldn't be there really on a car of this value. Knock, knock. Who's there? Whilst I've got my critical cap on, I also don't like the fact the seats are manually adjusting. It just feels a bit cheap in a premium car, and the actual seat controls feel quite cheap. I think for any premium luxury car, seats should be electronically adjustable rather than manual. It just cheapens it. I'm sure when you were buying one of these new, if you spent enough money, Jaguar would hook a brother up. But it shouldn't be an expensive extra. The overall layout's very good. You've got somewhere up here for your sunglasses, which you don't get on a full-size Range Rover. 
you've got the perfect place down here for your mobile phone. You've got two cup holders. You've got a decent sized glove compartment. You've got more storage under here. You've got quite big door pockets, which is all very practical. The boot is also very spacious at 650 litres, which is actually bigger than most of its rivals. And the seats fall flat, obviously. So you've got quite a big cargo area. As you probably noticed by now, this model's an automatic and it uses an eight speed ZF gearbox which is very good actually. It's very smooth, but also very quick to respond when you need it to. Jaguar have gone with their rotary gear select, which, as I've mentioned in previous videos, I'm not a huge fan of, but it does keep this area nice and clear. One other minor criticism I've got for the F-Pace is the location of this air vent to the right-hand side of the steering wheel. It's too low. All it ends up doing is freezing your right knee. You could have also bought the F-Pace as a six-speed manual, but you'd have to ask yourself some serious, deep questions. The auto is just better in every way. Space up front's very good. You've got plenty of elbow room, plenty of headroom, plenty of leg room, as is the space in the back. There's enough space back there for two and a half adults. I wouldn't want to be the unlucky one to draw the short straw and have to sit in the middle seat, but the outer two seats are pretty good. Plenty of leg room, plenty of headroom, plenty of visibility. The storage nets in the back of the two front seats do feel a little bit cheap. I can't imagine they'll last 10 years. It's quite a clever family car, this. They've put USB charging points everywhere. You've got two in the back, so your children won't end up bickering on a long journey. Brats. If they do end up bickering, you can always drown them out with the excellent sound system. The quality is superb. As is the display, actually. The reverse camera is crystal clear. Speaking of which, the whole infotainment system in general is very good. It's fairly quick to respond, easy to use, and it's not too distracted whilst you're trying to keep your eyes on the road. Take the sat for example. Usually you've got that silly disclaimer where you've got to click the OK button. Now on this, it allows you to press anywhere on the screen. It's clever that. Under the bonnet there are quite a few engines to choose from. All of them are good. If you fancy a petrol, there's a 2 litre turbo, there's a 3 litre supercharged V6, or if you're slightly mad and you've got deep pockets, you could go with the 550 horsepower 5 litre supercharged V8. If you live in the real world and you're a little bit more grounded, and you must buy a diesel for economy reasons, then there are two to choose from. There's a 2 litre 4 cylinder Ingenium turbo diesel, this one produces 180 horsepower, or you can go with a 3 litre V6 turbo diesel, which produces 295 horsepower. Now, personally, I would go for the 3 litre V6 turbo diesel, because I just think it's smoother, it sounds better, it's more buttery and refined. As I've mentioned before, I'm not a huge Ingenium engine fan. Most people here in the UK went for the 2 litre Ingenium engine, and to be fair, once it's warmed up, it does a pretty good job. It's just when they're cold, they're a bit clumsy and clattery. This 180 horsepower model does feel punchy enough when you poke it with a stick. Yeah, it performs reasonably well, actually. I've had this 2-litre Ingenium engine in loads of different cars over the years, Discovery Sports and XEs and XFs, and I've never found them to be particularly good on fuel. They've always been all right, but they've never been that great. I've been driving this around today, and around town I've been doing 37 miles per gallon, and on a motorway run I even saw 52. So, it isn't what you'd call thirsty. It'll do 0 to 60 in around 8.5 seconds. So, it does feel quite pokey. You can opt for an all-wheel drive version like this, or a two-wheel drive version, which are slightly cheaper. Now that sends power to the rear wheels. Personally, I'd try and seek out an all-wheel drive version, because it'll just give you a bit more confidence in winter. One thing I've noticed straight away with the F-Pace, is it's good fun to drive. It doesn't feel like a big, heavy, clumsy, wallowy four-wheel drive. It feels light and nimble, which isn't something that you'd expect from a diesel four-wheel drive. I'm pleased because they've stayed true to the brand. It's genuinely good fun to drive. It also rides very well. It's a little bit choppy compared to something with air suspension, but then everything will be. This one just rides on standard coils. On the bright side, it should be more reliable, but it really copes well with the corners. There's not much body roll, and it does absorb the bumps quite well. The seats aren't too firm and stiff either, they're nice and comfortable. The more time you spend in an F-Pace, you realise there's quite a lot to like. Reliability-wise, this is where JLR always seem to come unstuck. Now, I've said this time and time again, but I truly don't believe they're any less reliable than any other brand. Every single brand has its issues, and JLR are no different, unfortunately. There are no recalls outstanding that I can make you aware of. So really then, if you service them regularly, service the gearbox every 80 or 100,000 miles, run them on premium fuel, you'd be quite unlucky to have any issues. You might, being a Jaguar Land Rover, have the odd error message, which is usually just a phantom error. That can be caused by a whole variety of things, things like battery level, temperature, anything really. 
but other people's tales of woe genuinely wouldn't put me off spending my own money on one. Used prices here in the UK start at around £18,000, but that will get you a low-spec, high-mileage example. You're going to have to spend about £25,000 to get yourself a half-decent one. For anyone looking for this kind of vehicle, I think I could honestly recommend one. They're a really good all-rounder. They're good-looking, safe, practical, relatively affordable, cheap to run. I mean, what more could you want? I'd happily have one on my driveway. I'm actually quite smitten with it, which is fairly high praise from somebody so fussy. You know, I ought to come up with some sort of way to rank these cars, a bit like, a bit like Doug DeMuro does. On the weekend score, I would give this a 4 out of 10. You know, something like that. So let me know below in the comments if you think I should. Not sure how I'd work it, but anyway, something to consider. So, thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you're interested in getting into the used car business, then check out the link below. I've created an online portal with nearly 100 videos which explain every single aspect of the used car business, from funding to sourcing cars to preparing cars for sale to dealing with problem cars. It's all there, so do check it out. So yeah, cheers guys. See you next time.